Hello, everyone, and welcome to Little Field Live Streaming. Tonight, we'll be zooming through the universe on Spaceship Earth. Now, please welcome your host, Irene. Great, welcome. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us tonight. Um, I'm Irene Pease, and I'm going to be taking you on a little tour around your local universe and maybe some not so local universe. So I'm a Hayden associate. I do live shows at the Hayden Planetarium when it's open. Uh, so right now I've been doing <laughs> live streams for the Amateur Astronomers Association of New York. So you can check those out on Thursday nights on their YouTube channel, in addition to all the great content they have there. So I'm um, excited to talk a little bit about where we are in space, where we're going. It might feel like you're kind of stuck at home, but um, I know I get cabin fever. And for me, just kind of looking out into space and zooming around space is, is like therapy for me. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, jump right in here. I have a couple screens to share with you tonight. And first up, uh, we're mostly going to be using open space. So open space software is freeware uh, that's been developed at the Museum of Natural History in New York, um, along with partners NYU, Utah, and Sweden. Um, and you can find out all about them and download the software for free at their website, openspaceproject.com. So again, that's openspaceproject.com. Uh, so freeware, feel free to download it. It helps have a good graphics card to run it. Um, and it's just a software that we can use to kind of fly around in space, which is what we're gonna be doing tonight. Um, if you have questions, feel free to jot those down. I think we'll be taking some questions at the end. Um, so our other hosts will be helping me with that. So in open space, what we're seeing is all live, or not live, but all real data. Uh, it's part of the Digital Universe Atlas that's curated uh, mostly at the Museum of Natural History as well as some other astronomical data sets. So it's not just pretty pictures, like this is real stuff. So real groups of stars and clusters and galaxies and planets. Um, as much as possible, we try to get everything real in here. So trying to kind of simulate it like, you know, as if you were out in space. So not, you know, maybe cooped up at home somewhere. So tonight, um, starting local, looking at what we're going to be like, basically, yeah, how we're moving <laughs> and where we're headed. So, oh, yeah. So looking down on Earth, um, there's not really an up or down in space, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about looking down on the North Pole. Um, there's a convention that we use. We tend to be north centric just because uh, most of the earth's land mass is in the north, I guess. So we think of north as being the top or being up. So whatever, there's not really up in space, but again, we're, we're mostly gonna think of north as being up just as a convention. And that is kind of how we define, um, it is based on how some things are spinning in space. So if I turn on the earth uh, or not turn on the earth, but kind of fast forward through, through time, instead of going in real time, um, whoops, uh, I just crashed something. So just give me a minute <laughs> um, to bring that back up. It's a lot of data to stream. So sorry about that. I usually start this and then close it and reopen it, um, which I did tonight, but it didn't crash during practice. So it's crashing now because it's a lot of data and my internet connection is, is working on it. So let's try that again. Um, I come back here. Yeah, all good. Okay, yeah, so the earth is still there. The earth didn't actually go anywhere. Um, but let me just turn that off. And yeah, so come back to kind of looking at the earth from the top. The other thing that you might notice there, it wasn't on earlier, is the International Space Station. I'm actually gonna turn that off. Hopefully a lot of people got to see the launch earlier today. Um, and if you're in the New York area, there's gonna be a pass overhead tonight. So you can look that up online or maybe ask me about it later. So I'm gonna try this again, <laughs> try uh, moving through time. Um, there, a little bit closer. 
Not a little further away. All right. All right. So as we're as we have the Earth spinning, right? So we can imagine the Earth. Um, that's our first motion that I wanted to talk about is the the spinning of the Earth. So imagine it spinning like a giant merry-go-round. All right. So looking down from the pole, like the pole is like the center of our merry-go-round. And then if you were on the equator, you'd be furthest from the center. So that's like the edge of the merry-go-round. So if you think way back to the last time you were on a merry-go-round, right, um, the fun part was the outside because you're spinning around really fast. And then when you're closer to the center, you're not spinning as fast. You like sit there and read a book or whatever, just, you know, ignore the rest of the playground. So even though it doesn't even feel like you're moving right now, just with the Earth's rotation, um, we're not rotating at the, at the fastest part because unless you happen to live at the equator. Um, but if you're in New York, you're rotating at about 350 meters per second or about 780 miles per hour. So that's faster than the speed of sound and air. So you're actually zipping along pretty fast, just, you know, hanging out wherever you may be. And that's like an everyday thing. So it doesn't feel like that because everything else is moving around you. And remember, motion is relative. So if we're all kind of like whirling and twirling around, um, we don't really feel it, but you are moving, I promise. So that's just the motion of the Earth twirling, spinning, rotating in space. It has a little neighbor, our nearest, nearest world. Uh, we have a, a moon, our natural satellite, um, that's moving around us as well. And so I know no one's on the moon. I'm not going to talk about, you know, if you were on the moon, how fast you'd be moving. But just noting that the moon does go around us. So as the earth is kind of zipping around the sun, right? So you're familiar with daily motion, that's the earth spinning. So we're moving because of that. And then we imagine the earth is moving around the sun, but it's not necessarily going in a exactly straight line. Um, it wobbles a teensy bit because the moon, as it moves, it pulls in the earth gravitationally. So again, if you wonder, well, why, are, why aren't we flying off the earth, you know, like that giant merry-go-round if we're moving at 780 miles per hour, you'd think we'd fly off, but no, no, there's, there's gravity. So you can thank gravity for that among other things. So there's also a gravitational pull between the earth and the moon. Gravity is pulling on everything. Really fantastic force, useful for all kinds of things. But because of the pull of the earth and the moon, as the moon is going around the earth, it tugs the earth a little bit one way, and then it tugs it a little bit another way, and then it tugs it a little bit another way. Um, so the, the moon, yes, is going around the earth. Technically it's going around, they're going around each other. They're going around a common center of mass that we like to call the barycenter. But because the Earth is so much more massive than the Moon is, that center is actually inside the Earth. So although we show the path, so this blue line, that would be like the path of the Earth going around the Sun. So we show that as a nice, simple, straight line. And for the most part it is, but it technically wobbles just teensy weensy bit back and forth um, as that barycenter is shifting, um, as we shift around the barycenter. So again, that barycenter is inside the Earth. It's not at the Earth's center. Um, but we do get a little bit of wobble as we, as we move around the sun. So, so you're moving because you're twirling and you're moving because you're going around the sun. And I'm just gonna spend a little bit more time talking about that motion around the sun because that's pretty important stuff. Um, we use it to you know, mark our calendars. We see different constellations, different times of year, all kinds of things because we're moving around the sun. So, just take a moment and I'm just gonna move this over to focus on the sun. And you can see the orbits of a couple other planets in there. Um, you should see Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. And we'll just leave some time on there. These can kind of keep zipping around. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, the other planets, they're out there. They're just further away. So we can't see them yet. We'll get there. Um, but you notice, yeah, they're all going around the sun, different speeds, right? So Mercury, the closest one in, it's traveling fastest. So it's actually moving faster than the other planets. And it has a shorter distance just because it's closer in. So what's happening there? Well, I'm trying to center the sun um, exactly. And I'll actually bring up some grids in a moment. 
But you can already start to notice that Mercury isn't really orbiting exactly around the sun. I mean, it's the sun isn't at the center of its orbit. So let's check out a grid. Um, not that grid, the other grid. Yeah, that grid. Um, so if I center the sun on the center of this grid, that's basically this grid is oriented with uh, along with the solar system. So if we center the sun in there, um, now the, the other planets, Venus and, and Earth, um, we lose Mars. Yeah, there's Mars out there. Mars blends in with the grid. <laughs> um, those look almost circular. But first, let's just, you know, bring Mercury out to compare Mercury to our, to our polar grid here. So we can see, yeah, it's, it's hard to tell if Mercury is moving in a circle or not, but we can definitely see the sun is not at the center. So that's one of Kepler's laws of planetary motion, that planets orbit the sun, not in circles, but in ellipses. And the sun is not going to be in the center. It's going to be at a focus. So it's going to be off center for that ellipse. So we clearly see that with Mercury. Um, but if we look at Earth, let's take a closer look at Earth, see if I can line that up a little bit with, uh, yeah, with a circle there. So at this point, I'm actually going to pause time. So you can see the orbit of the Earth basically matching up here with our nice circle grid. But down here, it's a little bit further away. So what's happening? All right, so just like Mercury, but not as extremely, the Earth is also moving in ellipse. So sometimes we're closer to the sun. So when we're over here, we're a little closer to the sun. When we're over here in space, we're a little bit further away from the sun. <clears throat> so our, in our motion around the sun, that distance from the sun actually varies. Um, incidentally, this happens in June and this happens in January. So there's these points, the near point where we're near the sun, the sun near point, we call that perihelion. And then there's the far point where we're far from the sun. It's and it, you can tell it's really not a big difference, but it is a little bit further from the sun. That's aphelion. So aphelion um, occurs in uh, June or July, and then the perihelion occurs in early January. So another another part of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. And it's kind of hard to see with Mercury here. Mercury would be the best one to show it is that um, well, energy is conserved is one way of saying it, but basically planets are gonna travel faster when they're at their closest point and they're gonna travel slower when they're at their further point. So one way I really like to celebrate perihelion is by, you know, since we're going so much faster, but it's, it's really not that much faster, um, it's a little bit faster, um, but we are going faster. So I like to throw my hands in the air and say, we, it's like, you know, the fun part of the roller coaster even though you don't feel it. So we are whizzing around the sun at uh, several tens of thousands of miles per hour. It's about 67,000 miles per hour. So that's fast. Um, so we're really booking it. Not as fast as, uh, not as, as Mercury is going, but we're, we're going. We're definitely not just hanging out, um, twiddling our thumbs. So perihelion, aphelion, wobbling around the sun, whizzing around the sun, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. That's where, that's kind of what we're doing locally. Um, and then I also kind of mentioned, you know, that we're going at different speeds relative to our solar system neighbors. So again, some planets are moving faster than others. So the inner planets, the planets that are between us and the sun, they kind of pass us in their orbit. And the outer planets, if we look out, Mars is the next one, further out from us. So that one, we get to pass. So I speed up time just a little bit. Since we travel faster than Mars, every couple of years, uh, it's about two years-ish, um, we, we overtake Mars, so we pass it. And since all this just kind of looks like a line on our, on our sky, because we're, remember, we're on the Earth, and all of these, all these planets are kind of going around the sun in one plane, since we're in that planet, it just looks like this line on our sky. So we kind of see the planets going back and forth, back and forth, there goes Mercury, the other way, 
And then it goes the other way. So when they kind of change directions like that and go, quote unquote, the wrong way, uh, we call that uh, retrograde. So again, looking down from Earth's North Pole, planets orbit the sun counterclockwise. So we're looking, quote unquote, down. And the one way we can define that, um, we actually define the, the north poles of these things based on the directions that they spin. And that's based on the direction that everything's going around the sun. So we use this nifty thing that uh, physics students absolutely hate. It's called the right hand rule. And the right hand rule involves using your right hand. Um, if you have a left hand instead, that works too. There's different left hand rules. I never bothered to learn them because I have a right hand. So if you have a right hand, you, uh, you curl your fingers in the direction that the planets are going, and then your thumb, your right thumb, points north, right? So if you, if you curl your fingers around counterclockwise or anti-clockwise, I want to sound British without having the accent, if you curl them anti-clockwise, then your thumb points north. And you can do that for, for anything in the solar system. It's a, it's a convention that we just made up where we say that's, that's how we're going to define north. So that works. Um, well, there's other ways of defining north, but that's how we're going <laughs> to define it for, for, this, for these purposes. So, uh, so we see everything going around that way. Um, and so in the sky, sometimes we see the planets moving from east to west and then sometimes from west to east. So this weird switch happens every now and then. Like if I look out, I'm uh, actually going to take the case of Mars. Uh, so some of you may have heard of, of retrograde um, and saying, oh, you know, whatever planet is, is in retrograde motion. So I just want to show you what that actually looks like. And so I'm going to switch, uh, switch screens to a video, a uh, quick clip. Uh, so again, at the Hayden Planetarium, one of the things I do is I produce a video blog, um, Skylight. So you can find these at the Hayden website. And I'm just going to show part of this clip. This is part of the Mars Close Approach video. And so here on the left side of the screen, you have the sun in the center, and then just Earth and Mars orbits, right? So I left out the other planets for simplicity. And then um, over on the right side, that little orange dot, hopefully you can see it. And if it shows up on your screens, that's going to be Mars. So these are playing in, uh, I don't want to say real time, but these are synced, right? So what's happening here, you can see like a bird's eye view. Um, and then we'll see what happens in our sky, how we see Mars's apparent motion against the background stars. So if I go ahead and play this, we see Mars is generally moving from east, sorry, from west to east across the sky. But as we start to overtake it, it seems to pause and go back. So that's the retrograde motion where it's moving quote unquote backwards. And then it pauses after we've passed it and it seems to move forward again. So what, you know, the, uh, people used to have a really hard time trying to explain this using cycles and epicycles and circles within circles. Um, it was kind of a big mystery for a while what was happening until we started putting the sun at the center <laughs> of, our, of our models. Um, but this is just kind of an, an interesting part of the relative motion that we have with planets passing each other. So it's like, you know, you pass someone on the highway and as you pass them, they appear to move backwards. So you're both moving in the same direction. It's just that as you pass them, you're moving forward relative to them, even though they're still moving forward, um, but they're just moving faster. So that's just kind of a quick view of um, retrograde uh, motion. So we can go back to our view of open space. Um, missing something, that's okay. So, uh, so back to open space. And we have um, uh, the solar system. So I think we kind of covered everything that's happening in the solar system. The last thing, again, I just mentioned that, again, there's all these, all these lines, all these orbits, the paths of all the planets around the sun, they, they line up quite nicely. They're not all exact, right? So there we go out. That was a uh, Jupiter, so this is the orbit of Saturn we just passed. So if I try to look at this really edge on Saturn, and we should go out past everyone's favorite, every fourth grader's favorite, Uranus, and out past Neptune, right? So those are the eight planets. 
so yeah, all basically in a line, more or less. So we have a fairly flat solar system. So I do want to show a grid as we, because we're going to get a little further out. Okay, so there's the there's a grid uh, that extends really far. This extends out. Um, actually, I want a different grid. Uh, this grid extends out 10,000 light years, so plenty far. Okay, so our solar system, it's just like this one little corner of the galaxy, which we'll see in just a minute. So plane of the solar system. And the other thing, just because I like to show this, because it's fun, uh, the constellation lines. So everywhere within the solar system, the constellations look the same. Right. So if you go to another planet, you don't have to like learn new constellations. If you know the constellations on Earth, they're the same star patterns everywhere in the solar system. So you zoom back into Mercury, zoom all the way out to Neptune. They, the stars are so much further away uh, that those patterns are not going to change until we're way, way, way beyond all the planets' orbits. So I'm going to leave those constellation lines on and kind of move out into the rest of the galaxy. So we're gonna, we've took, took a look at, you know, how the sun um, or how the earth is moving around the sun, the earth is spinning, moving around the sun, moving relative to its neighbor planets. And now the sun is kind of pulling this whole collection of worlds through the galaxy. So we wanna take a look at what, what's happening there. So moving out, so we're about, we're a light year away, still no changes in the stars, right? So a light year, it's not until we're a couple light years out. So here we're getting to a couple light years out that we can start to see a few of the stars. See some kind of warping in there. Yeah, so there we're seeing some of the closest stars. So probably Megas and, or sorry, Proxima Centauri, um, Sirius, some of the closest stars to us uh, in space kind of warping. And now we're getting like a warping of the constellations. Whoa, all right. So how far away are all these stars? Far, but not that far. <laughs> so just a, a quick uh, misconception that I, I get asked about a lot when I'm doing like sidewalk astronomy. Um, people are curious about, you know, like if the stars are so far away that like if we're seeing, if like the stars that they're seeing in, in the night sky, if, if those have burned out, like if, are they still there? Like how far away are those stars? Well, yeah, they're still there. So as we move out into the galaxy, <laughs> we can see the most distant stars that we're seeing. So these lines are all representing like the brightest stars that you see in the night sky, like stars, plenty of those are stars you can't even see from New York City, right? Um, so even in a dark sky, all the stars that you're seeing are within a few thousand light years. Like the, one of the most distant stars you can see with the unaided eye without using a telescope or binoculars is about 6,000 light years away. So I think that's like one of these out here or that one, it's one of those. Um, so most of the stars are within several hundred light years. And then a few of them are just within, you know, a little further out, a few thousand light years maybe. Compared to you know the size of the Milky Way galaxy, which is a hundred thousand light years end to end, so the stars that we see in the night sky with an unaided eye just represent one tiny corner of our galaxy. And stars live for such a long time. We're talking usually tens of millions or billions of years, tens of billions in some cases. So light that's been traveling for a few hundred few hundred years isn't going to make much of a difference in a star's life cycle. The one star that I'll tell you that maybe has died out, maybe, maybe, but probably not, is Betelgeuse. The rest of them, they're still there, I promise. Um, so now that we're out here and you, know, you can kind of see the structure of our galaxy, the Milky Way, this looks a little bit different than what we see in the night sky because you know, we're kind of in the fog, but if we kind of pull back, we can see it's kind of a big flat disk denser in the middle, that's the galactic core where there's just a lot more stuff. There's a lot more stars, just higher density. Um, and then we have like these relatively flat spiral arms. So we're about halfway out on one of the spiral arms, but notice the plane of the galaxy compared to the plane of our solar system. Remember that's what this big grid thing is doing here. So the plane of the solar system, if I turn it around like this, we're looking down, we're looking north, right? So if I curl my fingers around this way, my thumb would be pointed out. 
right? So that would be the direction that the sun is headed. Um, so one kind of interesting thing is it's almost like our, our, our sun is like dragging the planets um, around the, the Milky Way galaxy. And we're kind of like shoveling along, except that we're really tiny compared to the galaxy. So it's not like we're scooping anything up. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's deflected. We're fine. Um, well, yeah, that's just kind of our orientation within the galaxy. So kind of a neat thing. And let's actually take a look then at where the sun is headed. So we have um, some star orbits that we can look at. So just like the, the, uh, the planets going around the sun, um, we have orbits for some stars going around the Milky Way galaxy. So this is, i move a little bit further out here. So this is the path of the sun um, over the course of about a billion years. Um, so it takes the sun about three quarters of a billion. So 220, 225 ish million years to complete one orbit, one loop around the Milky Way galaxy. So um, yeah, so this is like four or so paths. So it's not exact, it's not nearly as stable as the Earth's path around the sun, but it, it is pretty much, it stays in the plane, right? It doesn't get like really high or really low, right? It's still mostly in the plane. Okay, so that's nice. Um, and it doesn't get like really close to or really far from that galactic core, right? We're not getting dangerously close into the center. So we have a relatively stable orbit. All things considered, like this is pretty good, right? So it's like having a nice stable atmosphere, stable environment for, for life to, you know, do its thing and, and not get totally messed up. Um, as opposed to some other stars, right? So here's the orbit, this blue line, this kind of spirally whirly gig. That's the orbit for Barnard star, which is a star that's relatively close to us. Um, you can actually see it almost intersecting, like it goes right into that blob of, you know, where we're the center. Um, but it gets a lot closer to and further out from the galactic center. Um, it still stays mostly in the plane. Okay, so good for it, but not quite as, as stable as the sun's orbit. Uh, if we look at one other one, um, LaSalle, 9352, um, that one's a little bit more wibbly wobbly. That's like a, that's like the cyclone, right? Like that's a, you could, you could ride a roller coaster like that. Like that'd be okay. That'd be a fun thing. As opposed to this one, that, that's more of like a, one of the upside down roller coasters. It's just kind of all over the place. This is in case you wanted to know, LSR 1828, 3014. Yeah, that's how we name stars. So yeah, our, so our sun's orbit is actually relatively stable, <laughs> especially when we compare it to some of the other orbits. Um, so that's where we're headed um, on a, a galactic scale. So we're headed around the galaxy, very exciting. And if we wanna do just one more step, um, we can step out a little bit further and say, all right, well, where's our galaxy heading? So I'll go ahead and switch up um, our grid. We don't need our grid anymore. Let's say goodbye to the grid. And we don't need the sun's orbit anymore. So we can say goodbye to that. But I'm gonna turn on what we call the local group. And we'll add some labels for those. All right. And I'm also gonna switch out how the Milky Way looks. Um, I have to do this um, just quick effect that I turned off earlier. And there we go. All right, so we kind of flattened the Milky Way so it doesn't look as pretty, but that's okay. So we're gonna move out and all these, all these other green dots now, um, LNC and SMC, those are maybe the more well-known ones these are the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud that can be seen in the southern sky. Um, so those look like big blotches in the sky. And then all these other green dots, those are part of our kind of local group, we call it. Um, I'm actually gonna turn off uh, 
these other things. Um, so those are a bunch of small satellite galaxies, like moons of the Milky Way. So like planets have moons that are satellites. Um, galaxies, like large galaxies, like our Milky Way galaxy has small dwarf galaxies, like little galaxies that are satellites of it. So that's part of what we call our local group of galaxies. And then if we move away from that, there's this other group of dots, the blue dots. So we're the green. And then the blue dots, that's um, another cluster that's near us that contains the Andromeda galaxy and the Triangulum galaxy. So the Andromeda galaxy is actually close enough and bright enough to be seen uh, with the unaided eye. It's the most distant object that most people can see with the naked eye in, in the sky. So that's this blob here. That's the Andromeda galaxy. And then a little bit further out is the Triangulum galaxy. And then all these other blue dots are satellites of Andromeda. So you can, and if you can see like Andromeda 13 and Andromeda 20, whatever, um, all these satellites. So you say to yourself, self, remember that thing with the gravity and the moon and the earth and they were attracted because of the gravity and the gravity pulls the things together? Yeah. So this group and this group are being pulled together with that good old fashioned gravity, which I may or may not still have, nope. <laughs> which I'm, I think I lost, my, uh, I lost my video feed of that. Um, let me see if I can pull it up just real quick. And there's a thing, oh, good, it's here. So I'm just going to do another quick share, um, just two uh, little videos. Um, this is a simulation of what we think the uh, interaction between our galaxies might look like. So like I said, so this is actually Andromeda. This is what we see in the sky today. So this is from a very, very dark site. It's a little bit exaggerated, but this is the plane of our galaxy, the Milky Way kind of running through the center. And that little smudge, that's that other galaxy. It's about two and a half million light years away, um, but you can see it. But as they get closer over the next five billion years, it's gonna get a lot closer. So this is up to, well, you can see three, four, almost four. And then around four and a half billion years, they actually um, pass through each other. And then eventually we think they will um, do a second pass of the cores and they'll kind of conglomerate into a new type of galaxy. So instead of being like a spiral, it'll be uh, a different type of galaxy that we call an elliptical galaxy. So the question then that you should be asking yourself is how do we know? And the, let's see, is this it? Yeah, the reason we know, um, this is one of my favorite things on the internet. <laughs> um, uh, the reason we know is because we take um, simulations and observations and we compare them. So in astronomy, yeah, you can look up in the sky. That's mostly what I do. I don't do research, but other people do research. They'll um, collect observations from big fancy telescopes. Um, so we have um, observational astronomers and then we have theoretical astrophysicists and theoretical people who build simulations, these massive computer codes that take like months to run, they run the simulations in a computer and then compare the results to what we see in the sky. So how do we know what's gonna happen when two spiral galaxies collide? Because we've run simulations, so this is a simulation, and then we compare it to actual observations. So when the observations match our simulations, then we know we're on the right track. <laughs> and then we know that um, we're, we're doing something right. So again, this is another observation um, that matched um, another step in the simulation. So again, the Milky Way and Andromeda would come through the cores, the densest parts of the galaxies would do a first pass uh, because they have so much momentum. So they'll pass through each other. And I do call these interactions, not collisions. Um, because there's so much space between the stars. The stars won't collide, but there are also huge clouds of gas in these galaxies. Um, so those clouds of gas could collide and trigger additional star formation, which is an exciting thing, I guess, if you want more stars in your life. So second pass, and then the cores kind of coalesce into like this new feature 
um, like one super massive core and all the gas and dust will continue um, kind of downfalling and, and accumulating a lot around that into this new shape of galaxy that we call an elliptical galaxy. It's more spherical than the flat spirals that we saw earlier. So, um, oh yeah, so actually I should just mention this um, credit obviously um, produced by, oops, um, when you, wherever you see STSCI, that's Hubble. So those are Hubble, um, Hubble data and then the simulations um, from those folks. So, okay, made it. So we made it all the way, all the way out to the outer part of the local universe. Um, I won't take you any further out there, but we'll go ahead and uh, zoom back in home because I, I try not to leave people way out in the middle of like some unknown galaxy or between galaxies in the void. So we'll take you back home and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Hey Irene, can you hear me? Yes. So we have one question from Corey uh, who asks, are there other stars that have this fairly regular orbit around the Milky Way like our sun? Yes, yeah, so there are other stars that have very regular orbits. Um, so we're not completely unique. Uh, but I do like to show people the ones that are a little bit off, a little bit different. So there are plenty that have um, irregular orbits that might still be in the plane like Barnard, but there are gonna be other stars, yes, that have a, a regular regular distance and, and stay in the plane as well. No other questions? Now, when the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies interact, how do we know the stars themselves won't collide into each other? Ah, yes. So the space between stars is huge. <laughs> um, so even in the densest parts of our galaxy, um, I actually have an image. I think I have an image in here. Um, not that one. Let's see if I can do this. No, okay. Um, yeah, so even even in the densest parts of our galaxy, stars very rarely collide. They, they are so, they're huge, <laughs> but they're so, so small compared to the space between them. So very, very rarely do stars collide. You would need a, a, a huge stellar density and, and some really interesting odds um, in order to have, in order to actually have your stars collide. And I thought I had a picture here. Let me try, nope. Oh, there we go. That's the one. Um, so this is an image of a globular cluster. So this is a collection of um, about three quarters of a million stars. And in the center, the, the stellar density, the density of those stars is about 70 times what it is near our sun. But those stars are still half a light year or more apart. So yeah, the stars are big, but there's still just an awful lot of space between them. And we have one more question. Um, can you explain the concept of the multiverse? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, so multiverse, um, as far as I know, my, my understanding, and I don't know, there might be other, um, other multiverse theories. Um, in quantum mechanics, anything that can happen does happen if a given enough time. Um, but then if we say, well, what if everything that can happen does happen, period. So um, if I you know, click my mouse one way versus if I click it another way, uh, if I sneeze or if I don't, if an atom splits or if it doesn't, right? Um, both those things happen. So now in, with each option, you created another universe. And so the universe or the multiverse is constantly splitting off into more and more um, universes. So that's, yeah, I, I, that's, that's, that's all I've got. <laughs> now, what methods are used to create a picture of our own galaxy being that we are situated within it? That, yes, that's fantastic because yeah, we can't, um, there's not like a giant mirror <laughs> that we can look at, right? We, as far as people have been, we've only been to the moon. Um, we've barely sent our satellites I mean, within the solar system, we have like one satellite, one, well, two now, I guess, that are leaving the solar system. So yeah, so how do we know? We know by, uh, and for a long time, really, we, we didn't know. 
Um, we know by by looking at other examples, so like the simulations that I showed you, the simulation versus observation, and we know by mapping. So uh, most recently, within the last couple of years, um, the European Space Agency had this fantastic mission, this uh, big satellite uh, that was far, far out from the Earth, the Gaia um, satellite, and it collected uh, data on almost 2 billion stars. And using <laughs> the, the positions of uh, almost 2 billion stars, we were able to clearly map out the, our local part of the galaxy. So we still didn't get, um, let me pull out just a little bit so we can see some of this. Unfortunately, that's one thing that um, I have trouble loading on my Mac. So it, you can load the Gaia data using the software. I just can't do it on my computer. Um, so if you load Gaia data, it will actually show you like this, some of this structure, like we can actually see this, like we've mapped enough of those stars now, which is amazing. The one thing that we actually didn't know for quite a while was um, whether there was uh, a bulge or a ball <laughs> in the center of our galaxy, or sorry, a bulge or a bar. So now we know that it's more elongated. So we know now that we're in a barred spiral galaxy, but for a while we couldn't determine whether it was a bar or if it was a more spherical bulge. Um, so yeah, we now know that this is elongated and we are in a barred spiral galaxy, but that's relatively recent. Hey, this is a question from Vina. Why do scientists think that Betelgeuse may be dead and what evidence is there for it? Oh, so that that's the, it's probably not dead. It's highly unlikely that it's dead yet, but it's it's due to go supernova in the relative future. So like the next, probably less than a million years, a lot less than a million years, we're talking tens of thousands of years or less. Um, so that's a relatively bright star that you can see with the unaided eye that is a supernova. And as far as we can tell, it's towards the end of its life. Um, there was a kind of a exciting thing happening um, last uh, December, January, where it got a lot dimmer. So Betelgeuse actually gets uh, brighter and dimmer on a semi-regular basis. A lot of stars do that. We call them variable stars. They vary in brightness, getting brighter or fainter. Um, but Betelgeuse got much, much fainter. And so it was really exciting. And we weren't sure, we weren't, like, we don't think it's going supernova right now, but you know, you know, what else could be causing this? And so that was, it was really exciting when we see something that we don't understand because then we get a chance to like try and figure it out like another puzzle to solve. Um, but yeah, so it's probably not dead, um, but it, it, it could, that's the one that's probably more than any other stars that you're gonna see in the night sky with your unaided eye that's the one that's most likely to not be there anymore, but it's probably still there. How does the creation of a black hole affect the planets and stars around them? Creation of black hole. Um, so recenter on earth here a little bit. Yeah, so if the sun suddenly collapsed into a black hole, as long as it still has the same mass, um, not much changes. Um, as long as it has the same gravity, then it's still going to have the same attraction for um, any nearby planets or any nearby stars. Um, I guess the only difference is if something gets, you know, too close in, then it, it never comes back out. Like, you, you know, as hard as you might try. So like, you know, sometimes people ask, you know, what would happen if the sun collapsed into a black hole? It would get dark and then it would get cold and everything on earth would die because the source of pretty much all of our energy is from the sun, except for geothermal energy. Even fossil fuels, you can trace those back to solar energy. Um, it just took 50 million years to process. So um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's really, it's a matter of gravitational attraction. Um, so on a planet orbiting a star that, if a star collapsed into a black hole, there would probably be other things happening like a, like a supernova and your atmosphere would get blasted away and maybe the planet would get dis uh, get disintegrated in that process, but not by the black hole itself. So if you survive a collapse, a star collapsing into a black hole, as long as you're at a safe orbit, you're just going to keep orbiting this dark thing. How many light years across is the known universe? How many light years across is the known universe? 
um, I believe it's about 96 billion light years across. So <laughs> 96 billion light years. And we can, I think we can even go there. Can we go there? Maybe we can go there. Um, let me just turn on Tully while we're at it. Um, so the universe isn't that old, right? The universe is 96 billion years old. It's only 13 and change, almost 14. Um, but because what we're seeing on either end um, has moved since that light was emitted, then the stuff that we're seeing, say 13.6 billion light years away is actually much, much further away now. So this is, that is the observable universe in a ball. So we're actually looking at it from the outside, which isn't really allowed, but open space lets us do that. Um, so this piece of the observable universe, we observe it as being 13 point whatever billion light years away. Um, but since that light was emitted, the universe has expanded. So it's actually much, much further away. So um, I believe the number is around 96 billion light years across. That might be the, I'm pretty sure that's the diameter. Big, it's big. So I think we have time for one more question. This is uh, from Jack. Um, he asks, could you speak on the recently found potentially habitable planet estimated to be four light years away? Um, not much. <laughs> uh, recently found potentially habitable. So potentially habitable, there's a lot that goes into habitability. Um, as far as, and I'm not sure what markers they use to determine potentially habitable, if it was just in the, if it was in the Goldilocks zone, like if it was at a distance from its host star at which we think liquid water could exist on a surface. Um, so that's one classification. Um, and you'll forgive me because I'm, I'm not sure exactly what about this planet um, made them think it was potentially habitable? Um, if it was just that, or if they actually found markers in the atmosphere. Um, so we are basically looking for planets that are Earth-like, that are around sun-like stars. Like that's, that's our goal is to find a lot of those. So when you look at data, try, we're trying to bias it towards that. Um, but yeah, if you're too close to a star, then it's gonna be too hot. If you're too far away, it's gonna be too cold. But I mean, if you look at Venus, Venus should be more or less habitable, but then you look at its atmosphere and, and oh yeah, oops, runaway greenhouse effect happened and it's not so habitable. Um, so habitability is, there, there's a lot of question marks and there's only so much we can tell from you know four light years away. Um, but yeah, we can tell if it's at about the right distance considering the sun, the star that it's orbiting. And um, we can even tell in some cases they're, they're trying to find uh, what they call biomarkers in the atmosphere. So if we can see, if we can actually watch a planet pass in front of its star and try to, to tease out what gases are in the atmosphere, we can see, is there nitrogen? Is there, um, is there water vapor? Um, and see if there are the, the chemicals that we would think would be required for life. Just because it's habitable doesn't mean that there's life there. Um, so I'm going to be a Debbie Downer about it, saying like we don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, but it is it's 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 exciting and it's exciting to find something closer to home. So four light years is still not reachable by us by any means. Um, but never say never. So it's it's exciting to find stuff that's in our backyard, so to speak, um, still inaccessible. But uh, you never know. I mean, we just launched a rocket today it was pretty rad so who knows what we'll be doing 100 years from now so thanks for the questions and if there's no other questions um yeah i guess <laughs> thanks so much for joining us and i just want to thank littlefield for hosting um, again, if you want to check out Open Space, um, go to openspaceproject.com and it's a free download. You can read all about it, check out um, some of the other samples that they have on there and feel free to uh, 
if you want to see more of this, I do kind of a, a live stream for the, the AAA website, the Amateur Astronomers Association of New York. So you can find them on YouTube there, Amateur Astronomers Association of New York. Uh, you can also find them at aaa.org, aaa.org. If you go to .com, you get the car thing, so don't go there. Um, and they have some other online activities happening through the summer. So thanks so much.